Hello, this is Gary LaRue, Technical Editor at Microwave Journal. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, an informative tutorial discussing the critical material properties for millimeter wave radar used in autonomous driving, presented by Joey Kellner and John Coonrod of Rogers Corporation. Before we begin the presentation, let me cover a few items about navigating the webinar. In the center of your screen, you'll see a window containing the presentation. You may enlarge this to full screen to have a better view of the slide. The window labeled Resource List, which you can access from the green box at the bottom of your screen, contains a copy of the presentation. You may download this at any time. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay about an hour after we finish, allowing you to watch it again and recommend it to colleagues who weren't able to join this live event. You'll find a link to the recording in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. After the presentation, Joey and John will answer your questions. If you'd like to ask one, just type it in the Q&A box on your screen at any time during the hour. If you have any technical problems, you may click on the yellow box with the question mark at the bottom of your screen, which will take you to a user's guide. Or you may submit a question in the Q&A box, and we'll try to help you. That's it for the instructions. Now let me introduce our two speakers. Joey Kellner is the Automotive Market Manager for the Advanced Connectivity Solutions business at Rogers. She has more than 20 years' experience, including engineering, product management, and marketing roles at Rogers. In her current position, Joey works closely with automotive customers to understand and meet their RF material and supply requirements. Joey has a bachelor's in chemical engineering from North Carolina State University and an MBA specializing in technology, science, and engineering from Arizona State University. John Coonrod is the technical marketing manager for the Advanced Connectivity Solutions segment at Rogers, and he has 30 years' experience in the printed circuit board industry, split between circuit design, applications, processing, and materials engineering of flexible PCBs, and electrical characterization and application support of high-frequency circuit materials. John serves as the chair of the IPC D24C High Frequency Test Methods Task Group and has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Arizona State University. Joey, I'll turn the screen over to you now to start the presentation. Thank you, Gary, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. On our agenda, we have three main items. I'll give a, a brief overview of the automotive uh, radar market, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, John, who will talk about some specific RF material and PCB processing uh, considerations for 77 gigahertz radar antennas. And then we'll talk a bit about our new RO3003 G2 product, which was recently launched and is optimized for, uh, for 77 gigahertz radar antennas. There's really two segments that we see that are driving the growth of uh, radar applications in automobiles. The first is really safety. There's about 1.25 million deaths uh, related to vehicle accidents in the, during the year. That includes both drivers, passengers, and also vulnerable road users like pedestrians and cyclists. And there's a number of organizations out there trying to get those numbers down. Uh, one dimension is the Euro NCAP, or New Car Assessment Program. This is an organization in Europe that tests new cars and provides safety ratings. In order to meet some of their requirements, they require safety applications, which are really enabled by radar. Things like automatic emergency steering and braking, pedestrian and cyclist safety, uh, and then also driver monitoring and monitoring for children in cars to make sure that they aren't left by mistake. In the U.S., we have the National Highway <clears throat> Traffic Safety Administration, who also recommends set several of these types of applications which require radar. And we can look to other OEMs like Volvo, who are well-known for safety and have as their vision by next year, by 2020, that no one should be seriously injured or killed in a new Volvo vehicle. On the other side of things, we see mobility as a service driving more and more automotive radar applications. Just to give you a sense for the cross-section of companies that are involved here, you can look at the state of California, who has given 62 permits for testing for autonomous vehicles. 
And among that list, there's traditional OEMs and Tier 1s. Uh, there's a lot of startups who are working on things like uh, artificial intelligence. And then you see, even within that, a couple different segments. One is personal mobility, so what we think of as robo-taxis being developed by Lyft and Waymo. And then autonomous delivery services that will deliver materials and you know, groceries and things like that to your door. So there's companies like Neuro and BoxBot. We can look to some comments from um, some of the tier ones on what, what is the balance of these few influences. Vionier made some comments in their Q4 uh, 2018 earnings call saying that really um, the, the driver assistance applications are really what's driving the market right now, and that's going to remain. And the timing of the mobility as a service is a little bit more uncertain and maybe a little bit further out, but nevertheless a very important driver. And really, on the safety side, those really approached the system from the bottoms up. In the bottom right of corner of my slide here, we have a depiction of the, the six levels of automation. So the advanced driver assistance products are really working from the bottom up, getting into level one, level two, level three of automation, whereas mobility of service is really approaching it from the other end and trying to go straight to level four or level five and full automation of the vehicle where the passengers actually become, or where the drivers actually become passengers. Looking a little bit uh, closer into the automotive radar sensors, there's really two major frequency bands that we see these operating at, 24 gigahertz and then the 77, 79 gigahertz bands. 24 gigahertz are typically found on the rear of the vehicle and are often for short range functions like blind spot detection or rear cross traffic alert. There's two different bands within 24 gigahertz the 5 gigahertz wide band, which will be phased out by 2022, and then the narrow band, um, uh, it's about 200 megahertz in uh, bandwidth. On the 77, 79 gigahertz side, these are really uh, often seen for mid and long range functions like automatic emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, and today we see those typically on the front center of the car. Um, in general, higher frequency improves the velocity resolution of radar sensors and the wideband uh, can provide better distance accuracy and resolution. Today we're really going to focus on the 77, 79 gigahertz applications. That's where we see much of the design activity today. So today, while there are probably more 24 gigahertz sensors out there in the market, 77 and 79 are really what's growing as more and more of these functions are needed. And we also see a growing diversity of needs within this subsegment. Today, uh, we see these being used for object detection, but as the requirements grow, we're going to need higher and higher resolution radar, even up into imaging and getting more towards object classification. Of course, cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness is always a very important goal, and then as there's more and more sensors, how you integrate these into the vehicle is going to become a key attribute. Looking at material needs, for these automotive radar sensors, there's several different properties that must be met. First of all, you need excellent electrical properties, the tightly controlled dielectric constant, and low insertion loss. And then because this is for a safety application, and it's for an application which has a fairly long life cycle, these properties have to be reliable, they have to be consistent, and they have to uh, stay the same over time, over temperature, and over humidity. Again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of diversity in the de designs we see out there, so designers need options for those different types of designs, whether they be a cap layer on FR4 or an SIW design or a multi-layer RF design. And of course, cost-effective solutions again are needed. From Rogers, we have a pretty broad portfolio of products that are targeted at this market. Um, RO3003 and RO3003 G2 are our high performance materials which have very low loss and very stable dielectric constants, and we see those used most frequently. We also have our RO4830 laminates, which are a member of the RO4000 family, and these are really targeted for um, cost effective or cost sensitive uh, applications where material price is really critical. And then as we see more multi layer designs, that's where we would recommend a product like CLTE MW, which is a glass reinforced material available in many different thicknesses and is good for multi layers. So, next I'll turn it over to John Coonrod, who will talk a little bit more in detail about some of these specific properties that are needed for 77 gigahertz. 
Thank you very much, Joey. And uh, I'm going to be talking about more of uh, on the technical side. And to begin with, there's really um, six topics that are pretty critical to printed circuit board technology being used at 77 gigahertz for automotive radar sensors. And I've listed them here. Now, I'm calling them material slash printed circuit board properties because if you look at the list, that really looks like material properties. But in reality, there's a lot of printed circuit board uh, variables that get involved when you, when you start talking the details. So I'm not going to talk about the list right now. I'm actually going to go through each one of these points and explain a little bit more on uh, each topic. So to begin with, let's talk about the DK dielectric constant or uh, relative permittivity, the tolerance for that. So there's two different ways to think about the DK. Um, first off, the uh, material DK, uh, it's best to have a uh, material that has a dielectric constant that's controlled to plus or minus 0.05 or better. And that's kind of a general rule of thumb. Uh, but that's just something that we've learned over the several years of working with these applications. Another way to think about the uh, dielectric constant is the dielectric constant as it's perceived in circuit form. So if you build a circuit and you uh, have a test vehicle and you extract the DK from that circuit performance, you'll find there's more variables than just the dielectric constant of the material only. There's other variables, print circuit board related. There's uh, copper surface roughness. It's also frequency dependent. There's several different things. But anyway, we call that design DK. And design DK has, uh, as I just mentioned, a lot of different variables and different dependencies. And really, to best understand uh, what variation you would expect with design decay, uh, it really just comes down to brute force. You just need to go off and measure a whole bunch of circuits on many different lots of material and collect a lot of data and then look statistically of what to expect. So in this case, we did that, and I'm showing this on the slide. And the upper left chart is really um, us doing testing using our microstrip differential phase length method which is a pretty simple method, actually. What it is is we're using microstrip transmission line circuits that are different lengths, physically different lengths, uh, a short link circuit, long link circuit. They're identical in every way except the physical length. And from that, we can extract the effective decay of the microstrip, which is really a combination of the fields using air and substrate. And then from that information combined with the circuit information, geometry and things like that, we can figure out what the decay of the material is, actually. So that is the y-axis on the chart. The x-axis on the chart is frequency. And in this case, we tested a whole bunch of different circuits, I think about 73 or so, over a time frame of about four years. And uh, this is the data from all these different circuits, DK versus frequency. And out at 77 gigahertz, you see that there is a range of DK to be expected of 0.126. And that is a combination of several things. Uh, one is the dielectric constant tolerance of the material itself is plus or minus 0.04, which is actually really good. But that is a range of 0 0.08 for dielectric constant. So of that 0.126 range for the design DK at 77 gigahertz, 0.08 of that is the material. And then you have other aspects of um, things like uh, print circuit board fabrication variables of etching and copper plating thickness and a variety of things, trapezoidal effects, and then also copper surface roughness. So the copper surface roughness I'm talking about is the interface between the copper and the substrate. And that roughened surface does have an impact on phase velocity, which ultimately means the circuit can perceive the dielectric constant different. And I, I know it sounds a little confusing, but really what it comes down to is if you build uh, two different circuits on the exact same substrate, one with smooth copper, one with rough copper, the circuit with rough copper is going to have a slower wave propagation or slower phase velocity. And just by the natural mechanics of electromagnetics, a slower wave is perceived as a higher DK, even though the substrate is the same DK on both circuits. The circuit with the rougher copper will have a higher DK. And if that roughness varies, it will vary up and down. Lower DK would be smoother, higher DK would be rougher. So all copper does have some normal surface roughness variation uh, from lot to lot, sheet to sheet, or even within sheet. And that's really what some of this data is capturing. So in the case of the ED copper, so the upper left-hand chart is using the 5 mil RL3003 material uh, using ED copper. And the average copper roughness is 2 microns RMS, but it does vary up and down from that number. And as it varies, uh, of course, you're going to see some differences in the design decay. And there's also, again, like I said, there's print circuit board fabrication tolerances involved here as well. 
So this chart is actually showing you what to expect on a final circuit for a variation of the dielectric constant as the circuit would perceive it, which also relates to phase angle, which is a big deal because phase angle is one of those topics that's pretty critical, uh, and the consistency of phase angle is pretty critical for 77 gigahertz automotive radars. And um, now the chart on the bottom is using the exact same material, again, 5 mil 3003, except now it's clad with rolled copper, which is really smooth. And you can see the uh, surface roughness is 0.35 microns RMS is an average. And of course that does vary some, but just being that it is so smooth, it just naturally has less variation. So you can see out of 77 gigahertz, the design DK has uh, got a total range of 0.096. And again, remembering that the dielectric constant for the material is held to plus or minus 0.04 or a range of 0.08. Uh, that means there's not too much influence there by the rolled copper. And to be honest, if you really break it down, the rolled copper doesn't have that much influence. Uh, a lot of the other numbers there are a stack up of printed circuit board uh, fabrication tolerances. So the uh, bottom line for this would be dielectric constant of the raw material having a, a tight tolerance of plus or minus 0.05 is a big deal. However, understanding in circuit form is probably a bigger deal. And then looking at the effects of copper, is also very important, and a smoother copper is going to have less decay variation at these higher frequencies. Um, now talk about DF quickly, uh, and what I'm showing here is insertion loss curves using, again, 5 mil 3003, and 5 mil 3003 with rolled copper is the gray curve, 5 mil 3003 with um, ED copper is the blue curve, and by the way, that curve and that uh, material is actually what's used uh, most in the industry right now for these applications. And then the orange curve is a competitive material that's a PPE-based material thermal set. And uh, what's interesting about this curve is down at lower frequencies, it matches relatively well with the 5 mil 3003 ED, uh, but they're kind of playing a trick here, and that is they're using extremely smooth copper to account for differences in dissipation factor. And their dissipation factor is obviously higher than 3003, and if it wasn't, that orange curve would be matched to the gray curve because it's just about got the same roughness as rolled copper. Uh, but anyway, um, the thing about dissipation factor is it is frequency dependent. As you go up in frequency, the dissipation factor will increase, and that's true with all materials. However, some materials will increase much more than others. And in the case of 3003, yes, the DF does increase as you go up in frequency, but not much. In the case of this particular PPE-based material, as you go up in frequency, the dissipation factor does increase. And pretty significantly, after you hit about the millimeter wave range of frequencies around 33 or 35 gigahertz, that's when the dissipation factor starts overriding the benefit of very smooth copper they have on this material. And as you see, as you go higher and higher in frequency, it uh, definitely diverges and becomes a lot more lossy. So dissipation factor and understanding really how that varies across a wide range of frequency can be pretty important for these applications. <coughs> Excuse me. Another topic is copper surface roughness. I already touched on that pretty quickly about how it affects uh, phase response and extraction of decay and things like that. But copper surface roughness also affects um, the conductor losses, so it does impact insertion loss. We have several good papers on this topic, and uh, if you want more information, please let us know. But really what I'm showing here, again, is the same material, 5 mil 3003 with ED copper on the left, 5 mil 3003 with rolled copper on the right. And on the left, you can see that the ED copper does have more variation at 77 gigahertz uh, for the amount of insertion loss. And on the right, it's much uh, tighter data grouped, and uh, it's obviously less variation. Also, you can see the numbers are pretty significantly different, and that's because the smoother copper does not cause as much conductor loss as a rougher copper. So the ED copper on the left, you can see the scale is uh, a different scale, and you definitely have higher insertion loss with the ED copper with the chart on the left and the rolled copper circuits on the right. Uh, much lower insertion loss. In fact, that's about the best insertion loss I've seen on circuits, and I look at a lot of different circuits. Um, so there's also something called TCDK. TCDK stands for thermal coefficient of dielectric constant. All materials have this property, and it's basically how much the dielectric constant of the material will change with the change in temperature. And the perfect TCDK would be zero parts per million per degree C, basically saying the DK is not changing with the change in temperature. And on the uh, chart that I'm showing below here, that would be equivalent to 1.0 on the y-axis because the chart is a normalized chart 
for dielectric constant of different materials and at room temperature. And just one thing I want to point out here is, uh, well, to, to begin with, I'll talk about a general rule. And a general rule of thumb after working with many of these applications in the industry is um, a good TCDK value for a material is 50 parts per million, 50 parts per million per degree C. And uh, the reason I put absolute values around that is because a TCDK can be negative or it could be positive. But basically, the closer to zero, the better. Um, most materials are actually hovering around 30 to 50. It's not unusual to see that, and it works quite well. In the case of the 3003 materials, that TCDK is three parts per million per degree C, which is one of the best or the best that I know of in the industry, actually. And on the chart, that's the dark blue curve, and you can see that's uh, hovering right around the ideal 1.0 line. Also on that chart, I put in there kind of a, for a sanity check, a... Uh, a, a curve for the TCDK of FR4, which is the brown curve, and that's the one with the biggest change. But also FR4 is not intended to have a good TCDK, but it's really there just as kind of a sanity check. And then the purple curve is actually uh, is showing what happens with normal or let's say PTFE materials that may not have been formulated to deal with TCDK quite as well, and they do have a normal transition around room temperature. In the case of 3003, it is PTFE-based, but the way we formulated it with special filler and other things we've done, we've been able to account for this normal behavior of PTFE and pretty much quiet it down to the point of having an ideal curve just about. Um, there's also another way you can look at TCDK. So the last chart was us measuring TCDK of the material itself, and uh, this particular chart is looking at TCDK being tested in circuit form. And again, what I'm doing is testing microstrip transmission line circuits using the differential phase link method. And what I did was set up circuits, tested them at room temperature, and then I heat them up to 65 degrees C. And at 65 degrees C, I collect phase information, heat them up again to 125 C, and collect phase information again, all in the exact same set of circuits, and actually without moving anything. And then I report the data here. So I extract the DK from those measurements, and that is on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. In the case of the circuits that's using 5 mil 3003 with uh, ED copper, I see a difference of 0 0.001 at 77 gigahertz, which is basically in the measurement noise. And that's equivalent to a phase angle shift of about one degree at 77 gigahertz. And then uh, still talking about, uh, as a reference anyway, this competitive material that is a thermal set PPE-based you can see at 77 gigahertz, uh, the difference between room temperature and 65 and 125 degrees C is a pretty significant difference. So their TCDK for that particular material is definitely much higher than 3003. And we're seeing a difference in dielectric constant of about 0.031 at 77 gigahertz and a difference of phase angle, uh, which is typically the big concern with automotive radar, uh, six of uh, 17 degrees at 77 gigahertz. So TCDK is definitely something to keep in mind. Another thought is moisture absorption. And um, of course, all materials have this property as well. And in circuit form, that means the circuit can change performance because the circuit material can absorb some amount of moisture just from the environment. And water vapor or moisture is a high decay and also it's polar, so it's gonna cause more losses. And what we've done here was, again, testing the uh, circuits in microstrip differential phase link method. And uh, I'm sorry, this is actually microstrip differential link method. So we're looking at insertion loss, not phase. And what we see at 70 gigahertz is a difference of about 0.1513. Even with reading glasses, I can't see that. I apologize. Uh, but anyway, it's not a big difference at 77 gigahertz. And that's really because the uh, material is formulated to be very low in moisture absorption. Now, that was the comparison between the circuits being tested at room temperature and also circuits being tested after being conditioned at 75, I'm sorry, 8585. And 8585 means 85 degrees C and 85% RH. Now, the same testing except for the different set of circuits, again, looking at this uh, PPE-based uh, thermal set competitive material, same type of testing, room temperature, red curve, orange curve is after three days at uh, 8585. And you can see there is a remarkable difference in insertion loss. So uh, moisture absorption most certainly does play a role here. And this slide is actually looking at the same testing, but now I'm collecting phase angle information and extracting DK for the y-axis frequency on the x. 
And here I get a difference about 0 0.005 in dielectric constant at 70, uh, 77 gigahertz between room temperature and three days at 8585. The competitive materials uh, is showing a difference um, of about 0.04, so about eight times the difference actually at uh, 70 gigahertz for room temperature versus three days at 8585. And that's a pretty significant difference. And the way some of the radar designers are interested in thinking about this data sometime is shown here because a lot of times they want to understand differences in phase angle. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the same data as the last chart except zoomed in closer in frequency from 76 to 78 gigahertz. And again, the uh, differences at room temperature and three days at 8585 for the 5 mil 3003 with DD copper you can see there's a difference in phase angle of about 8.9 degrees. The competitive materials has about three times that difference, about 27 degrees. So that does make a pretty good difference when it's just uh, exposed for three days at 8585. Of course, if you expose it for longer, you're not going to get any improvement. And actually, these numbers will change a little bit, which we are working on, by the way. And we really don't see a lot of difference of the 3003. There is a little bit, but the other materials, we do see even a bigger difference. Um, excuse me, glass weave effect is another um, topic that's been coming up over the years. Actually, the glass weave effect's been pretty well studied in the high-speed high, uh, high speed digital industry. And then with more and more millimeter wave applications coming online, the RF industry is starting to embrace a lot of studies on this now. And what the glass weave effect is, uh, basically laminates as they're made, they, many of them have this glass weave that is embedded into the laminate to give it uh, mechanical rigidity and just to make sure that the dimensional stability is more stable and overall it's just a, a benefit for a lot of mechanical and thermal issues. Uh, but the glass itself has a decay of about six and usually for materials used in these applications, the resin system is usually around about two to three depending. Um, so you can actually get some pretty big differences in decay in very isolated areas. And that's what I'm trying to point out here. So the areas that would have the highest EK looking straight down through the circuit, so to speak. So if you can imagine a signal on the top and the ground plane on the bottom, which is not shown, and you're looking straight down through the circuit with a clear resin system. In the case of the blue arrows, I'm pointing out areas where there's actually two layers of glass fiber, and that's going to be the highest EK area looking through the Z-axis or the thickness axis. In the case of the yellow arrows, that's looking at uh, one layer of glass just for the glass bundles. And of course, the, the resin system, you'd have to imagine to be top and bottom of this glass. And then finally, the green arrows is showing the lowest decay area where there is no glass. It's the openings, uh, those are the openings between the glass bundles. And that's just going to be the raw resin system. So essentially, you get a difference of about 2 dk to 6 dk in these isolated areas. Now, uh, whoops, excuse me. Press the wrong button. Okay, so there's a couple of ways to think about this glass weave effect. One is a local trace environment variation due to that, and another way would be a periodic decay variation. And on the left is the local trace environment, and I'm really trying to show a difference of two signal conductors. Again, you can imagine microstrip, ground plane on the bottom that you're not seeing, signal conductors on top, and these two conductors would have two different dielectric constants based on how they're aligned to the glass weave effect. And uh, the conductor on the left, I'm calling it a high DK, and the reason why is because that conductor is aligned to the glass weave uh, pattern in such a way that it's over the knuckles, bundles, knuckles, bundles, as you go from the bottom to the top of that conductor run. And then the neighboring conductor is over an area where it's bundles open, bundles open. So the left conductor is going to perceive a higher dielectric constant than the right conductor. And uh, that's, that can be definitely an issue, especially at millimeter wave frequencies where the wavelengths are very small and more sensitive to DK anomalies. Now, the picture on the right is something that I think is probably the bigger problem with glass weave effect at millimeter wave, and that is uh, the periodic DK variation. And that's when, if you look at one conductor, let's take the one on the left, you can see that it's a little bit of an angle in relation to the grid of the glass weave. And the portion that I have circled and says low DK, that conductor is going over an area of the glass uh, fabric where it is bundle open, bundle open. And then as you move up the conductor farther, and I have it circled and says high DK, the conductor in that area is going over an area of the glass where it's knuckle bundle, knuckle bundle. 
And what happens is if you continue on with this, you're going to get low decay, high decay, low decay, and it's acting almost like a stepped impedance structure except uh, for decay. So, again, a millimeter wave frequencies, that can be a pretty big deal. And then the conductor on the right is basically showing the thing, same thing. Um, just to talk about glass in a little bit more detail, there's simply three different flavors, I guess, in a very general sense. There is the standard open weave glass on the upper left. There is expanded weave, which is sometimes called spread glass, but it still does have some openings. And then there is mechanically spread glass on the bottom left. Now, in the case of our materials that are being used in these 77 gigahertz automotive radar applications, the RL3003, which is right now the dominant player in the industry, uh, it has no glass, so it has no concern with the glass weave effect. And our new material that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, that is the RL3003 G2. That also has no glass weave effect because it has no glass weave. And in the case of the 4830, which is the material we developed a few years ago at the request of the industry, uh, this is a, a uh, thermal set material, so it's not PTFE, and it has a lot of good attributes for circuit fabrication and other things. Uh, but it does have glass uh, weave reinforcement, and in this case, we use the mechanically spread glass, as you can see on the left, and the openings between the spread is, I've looked at this a lot, and I normally don't see any openings, but occasionally you might see a little bit, and it might be a mill or so, but it's usually very tightly uh, weaved together. So back in October last year, I did a webinar, and it was in regards to this glass weave effect. So if you're interested in more details, you could probably get on Microwave Journal and look at the archives and uh, get into a little more detail. But here I'm just going to give a quick overview. And uh, one of the points of the webinar was uh, basically if you purposely align a circuit to the glass weave effect exactly, to where we have a conductor going straight over the bundle knuckle, bundle knuckles, and then another conductor of the exact same design, same material, same everything, and have the signal conductor aligned over bundle open, bundle open, what kind of difference will you see? And in this case, what we did is we used materials that were 5 mil, 3,000, I'm sorry, 5 mil uh, pure PTFE materials with glass. And I did that purposely to um, make the, um, the effects a little bit more obvious anyway. And also our circuits were 75 ohm circuits, which means the conductor was thin. We used transformers to get good signal launch. But we did that because we wanted the conductors to be very narrow so you could detect these differences in the glass weave. If we had not done that and we had wider conductors, then you get kind of a blending because the conductor will be over multiple areas of open and multiple areas of knuckles and things like that. Uh, so anyway, in this study, uh, what we did was we looked at kind of a worst-case scenario, and what we found was something pretty interesting. The table of information that's shown below here is comparing the results of the conductor that is the knuckle bundle uh, alignment to the glass weave and um, the exact same circuits, same materials, same design, same everything, uh, a conductor that is aligned to the glass to where it's over bundle open, bundle open. So that's the data in the table here where it's comparing the differences. So looking at a 106 glass, and by the way, the glass files that I'm um, referring to here, 106, 1080, and 1078, uh, those are very commonly used in the industry, especially 106 and 1080. Uh, so the 106 is an open weave balance glass construction. Balance meaning there's the same density of glass on both axis, X and Y. And um, the difference I see in propagation delay is about 7 picoseconds. The difference I see in phase angle is a big number at 77 gigahertz, and that's 100 degrees. And then the difference I see is I extract the dielectric constant at 77 gigahertz, 0.09. And again, this is the same material. The only difference is we align the circuit right on top of the knuckle bundle, and then another circuit was aligned over the bundle open configuration of the glass. And then on the 1080, which is also open weave, and uh, it's got a little bit different geometry. It is unbalanced, meaning that the, there is more glass density on one axis versus the other. Propagation delay is a little higher. The phase angle at 77 gigahertz is definitely higher, at 149 degrees, the difference between these two conductors, which is very significant. And then as you extract DK, you can see a difference at 0.14, which can be a pretty big deal. Now, of course, this is just one aspect of the overall circuit DK variation. This is just glass weave. So you still have other aspects that I've talked before about uh, the dielectric constant and the tolerances and things like that and the design DK tolerances and circuit fabrication and all that kind of thing. 
Uh, now, one thing that's pretty interesting here is looking at the 1078 glass, which is a spread glass. And uh, you can see here the differences between the conductors over the knuckle bundle configuration compared to over the bundle open configuration. Not a lot of difference for the propagation delay and the difference in phase angle of 77 gigahertz, uh, about 20 degrees, which is not too bad. And, uh, and then at the DK being extracted at 77 gigahertz, a difference of 0.02. So spread glass most certainly does make a pretty big difference for this glass weave effect. Uh, this slide and the next several slides, I'm not going to be able to talk about in too much detail. I'll give you a quick overview, and then, of course, you have this uh, presentation as a resource. You can uh, go through this and spend a little more time on it. If you need um, more information on this topic, then please let me know. I'll be happy to share it. But basically, this slide and the next several slides is talking about a issue that I run into from time to time where designers, when they're designing at lower frequency, microwave frequencies, let's say, many times they're going to use a microstrip structure. And then when they get up into millimeter wave, they start thinking about other things uh, at higher frequency that come into play, like spurious wave modes, uh, surface waves, radiation, just a lot of different things that happen. And one thing to minimize those concerns would be to change the design from microstrip to granite coplanar waveguide, which is uh, done a pretty good amount. But it turns out that the fabrication tolerances that affect the RF performance for microstrip and granite coplanar waveguide, those fabrication tolerances and effects are much more significant with the granite coplanar waveguide than they are a microstrip. So we did a study uh, several years ago where we used the same piece of material, cut it in half, had the exact same circuit designs made on uh, basically the same designs and the same material, same sheet of material. And the only difference was copper plating thickness. We purposely plated the copper thin and thick and looked at the differences in insertion loss, which I've shown here. I'm not going to talk about too much there just because of time. And then we looked at phase angle measurements and the effective dielectric constant is the y-axis on this chart. And then frequency is on the x-axis in the millimeter wave range of frequencies. And what's interesting is you can see a pretty big difference in the effective dielectric constant of these circuits. And again, remembering this is on the same sheet of material. There is no difference. There are two different designs. One is tightly coupled, one is loosely coupled. And the tightly coupled, basically you have coupling between the ground signal ground that is very close together. And when the copper is plated tall or thick, then you have more fields in the air Air is the lowest dielectric constant, so the circuits that are tightly coupled and thick copper is going to have more coupling than air, and it will have a lower effective dielectric constant. Those same circuits with thin copper that's tightly coupled, you have less coupling than air, current density shifts down to be closer to the base of the conductor at the substrate, as do the fields, and now you have a higher effective dielectric constant because the fields are using more of the substrate. So for granite coplanar waveguide, copper plating thickness by itself can make a pretty significant difference in effective dielectric constant, which does relate to phase angle, of course. Um, and that's probably good enough for that topic. Again, if you need more information, uh, email me, and I'll be happy to, to give you a little more details on that. So the next few slides I want to introduce to you a new material that uh, we brought to the market. And really what this comes down to is learning curve. So over the last many, many years, uh, Rogers, along with our customers that are doing designs at 77 gigahertz and customers building these circuits at the fabricator site, we've worked together on a lot of different projects, and we've learned a lot about how our materials behave in these applications. And from that, uh, we've found that the RL3003 materials that's been used for years and years in these applications works really good. Now, we formulated those materials, I'm guessing, 30 years ago. It's been a while. So they were not formulated with 77 gigahertz automotive radar on mind, but those materials work really good for that, and that's what's being used the most in the industry right now. But from our learning curve of working with our customers very closely, and we found that there's some things we can do to actually improve, and I'd have to say fine-tune the 3003 formulation, to address all the major issues, or in, and a lot of the minor issues, actually, at 77 gigahertz automotive radar. And uh, that's some of the things that we're talking about here. So a few of the challenges was uh, we wanted to get a little bit better insertion loss on the ED version of it. Of course, the rolled copper version is as good as it gets. Uh, also, the dielectric constant variation, we wanted to improve that. And then uh, there's definitely been trends in the industry to use more microvias and also smaller microvias. 
And there are some challenges to that in the formulation of, uh, well, any material for that matter. And what we did is we formulated the RL3003 G2 laminate to specifically uh, address these concerns, and we did. And we have a lot of data to share with you if you're interested in the details. I'm just going to give you a quick overview today. So basically, the RL3003 G2 is uh, very much like the RL3003. It is a ceramic fill PTFE-based material, uh, but we are using a little different ED copper on there that's very smooth. And uh, it's pretty close to having performance of rolled copper, as I'll show in the next slide. Uh, so we definitely were able to improve the insertion loss significantly with this different copper. We also, um, um, besides that, also the copper uh, helps the insertion loss, but also helps the uh, phase response. And what I mean by that is since it's a smoother copper and naturally has less roughness variation, which means the design decay is going to vary less. So now you have a more consistent design decay due to smoother copper. Also, in the formulation, we worked on things to make sure that the DK of the material itself is more consistent. And then it is a homogeneous uh, laminate. So what I mean by that is if you look at some other materials in the industry, sometimes what you'll see is uh, in a cross-sectional view, you would have copper, some type of bonding material, the substrate bonding material copper. And that bonding material sometimes is pure PTFE or some other kind of material. And that little anomaly between the copper and the main substrate can cause RF differences at millimeter wave where these wavelengths are very small, and especially true with any kind of coupled features. And if it's ground coplanar waveguide, you could pick up on some differences there due to coupling. But that's not the case with the 3003 G2. This is all homogeneous. So it is uh, basically copper, substrate copper, period. And um, then also to enable the uh, microvias and also the much smaller microvias, which are basically laser vias, we uh, applied the smoother copper, as I already mentioned, but also we did something with the filler, uh, where our filler is much, uh, much different, smaller, and spherical, and that helps a lot with the microvia processing. So on this slide, I'm showing some features and benefits of this material. I'm not really going to get into too much detail here. But the picture on the bottom right is showing a cross-sectional view of the uh, fine mill thick RL3003 G2 laminate. Picture on the uh, right is the legacy material, RL3003 uh, laminate. So the G2, RL3003 G2 laminate on the left, you can see that there's pretty big differences in the copper tooth or the copper profile. And specifically, when I talk about copper surface roughness, I'm talking about the copper at the substrate copper interface. And you can see on the picture on the left at the G2 that the, uh, copper, the copper surface is actually very smooth. You can really hardly even see the, the copper dendrites of the teeth there. On the right, the RL3003, that is rougher. You can see that. That's also pretty typical of most DD coppers, to be honest. It's not extreme, but it is rough, and you can see it, and that's normal. And then also comparing filler, uh, on the left, the RL3003 G2, the filler is much, much smaller. It's also spherical. And on the right, the RL3003, the legacy materials, the filler is, uh, I guess, more angular, more chunky, uh, and that's just the nature of it. And uh, so that's some of the improvements that we did with this product. And we've already had several uh, customers that are uh, pretty savvy with this technology, investigate it, and getting very good results. So uh, let's take a look at insertion loss differences. Uh, the differences in insertion loss I'm showing here, again, I'm using the microstrip differential length method and comparing insertion loss of our legacy material that's, again, 5 mil 3003 that's being used predominantly in the industry right now. The red curve is actually what's used most in volume, and that's 5 mil 3003 with the ED copper. And at about 77 gigahertz or so, you get a insertion loss of about 2 dB per inch. And that's testing circuits, uh, by the way, that's testing circuits with bare copper, so we do not put plated finish on this unless we've done studies where we actually do that. But in this case, it's bare copper circuits, so no plated finish, no solder mask. So this is just a bare copper circuit showing insertion loss and getting about 2 dB per inch out around 77 gigahertz. And then the green curve, same material, except now it's using rolled copper. And that is, again, 5 mil 3003 with rolled copper, which is really smooth. And you can see the insertion loss is much lower at 77 gigahertz. Uh, actually, it's below 1 dB. I think it's about 0.95 on the average. So that's considered extremely low loss. And then the blue carb is our newer material. That is the 5 mil 3003 G2 materials. 
and it's using a very special smooth uh, ED copper. And you can see that made a big difference in insertion loss. It's not quite as good as rolled copper, but it's getting pretty close. So that's a pretty significant improvement over the standard ED copper that's found in the industry. Um, I think that's all I have, and it looks like I did pretty good for timing this time, so that's good. Uh, so we do uh, uh, would like to invite you to our, our Rogers Technology Support Hub. This is a quick uh, overview of that. On the uh, Technology Support Hub, we have a lot of information for you. You can become a member, and you have uh, papers that you can look through that we've uh, presented and uh, published, magazine articles. We have calculators, videos. Uh, a lot of the videos are uh, different people at Rogers presenting at trade shows, going through different topics. Uh, so we have a lot of good information there. We also have an area where you can ask an engineer. So whatever region you're in, you can ask a question, and the uh, sales engineer in that region uh, will answer your question back. And um, that's our technology support hub. And it looks like we have a pretty good amount of time for questions, so I'll open up to that. All right, John and Joey, thank you very much for the informative presentation. You always uh, provide a lot of data, a lot of good uh, content for people to, uh, to use and take back to their, their jobs with. As you noted, we do have a good amount of time for question. we, uh, questions. We do have some questions in the queue, but we can certainly take some more. So I'll invite our viewers to ask a question by typing it into the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll answer as many as we can. So let's uh, start with kind of a broad brush question. Uh, one of our viewers is asking, what are the, some of the key numbers that automotive radar sensor manufacturers measure, and how do the materials play a factor in improving the radar performance? Yep, that's a good question. And uh, we've been working with the radar designers and the fabricators over the last several years, and uh, we've been exposed to a lot of the different things they're looking at. And I'd have to say, for the most part, phase angle is usually one of their bigger concerns. Insertion loss definitely is, but phase angle and phase angle consistency is a really big deal. And uh, normally, um, it depends, and I really hate to give you numbers on that because it depends so much on the design. In some cases, trying to hold a phase angle of uh, plus or minus 20 degrees is important. In other designs, not important at all. It really depends on how it's designed. Uh, so I hate to give you an answer that it depends, but unfortunately it really does depend. It really depends on the design of the, uh, the radar sensor. But for the most part, uh, phase angle is usually the topic uh, that seems to come to the surface the most. Insertion loss is a big deal, um, and consistency in insertion loss can be. Uh, but basically lower losses, that gives you a little bit better distance and resolution for how the radar behaves. And um, the phase angle also gives you a little bit more accuracy and resolution for um, looking at azimuth and elevation and things like that. So unfortunately, I really can't give you a solid number on any of that because it, it depends so much on these different designs. And some designs, it's really pretty tight uh, designed for these numbers. And other designs, it's pretty forgiving. So that's about the best I can do. All right. Well, let's uh, go to another question. You identified uh, six factors or six areas to be concerned about. What would you say is the most critical for reliability? This viewer says, I understand automotive safety uh, needs to pass the AEC Q100 grade one reliability. Yeah, yeah. I guess the phase angle of consistency already beat that to death, but that's definitely a big deal. But also for reliability, uh, what comes into play there is uh, things like uh, TCDK and CTE and, and different properties like that. So if you have a uh, 77 gigahertz radar that's been developed in a lab and everyone's happy, once it goes out in the field and it's uh, going through wide swings in temperature and humidity, if the material is not well controlled for that humidity change, uh, the radar is definitely going to change performance. So that's something to be considering. Also, CTE is pretty important because these circuits are typically hybrid multilayers. And what I mean by that, they're typically four or six layer copper circuits. Um, and normally the outer layers, layer copper layer one and two, is the RF layers used in the 3003 materials or the 3003 G2 or 4830. Anyway, that's the RF layer. And it ties into other layers below there that are usually uh, high TTFR4 layers. And uh, CTE can be a big deal because you have a lot of plated through holes through all these different layers, 
And if the C CTE is not very good, as in, you know, a high CTE, uh, and just as a rule of thumb, usually if the CTE is 70 parts per million per degree C or greater, then that can be a concern for plated through hole reliability. And what I mean by that is these plated through holes that connect in one axis to another, in Z axis, and as the circuit heats up and cools by different temperatures, the plated through hole that connects these layers can be stretched and actually broken if the CTE is poor. In the case of the 3003 materials, the CTE is uh, really good, it's closely matched to copper. So we don't have that issue, but that is a reliability issue that can be a problem. And um, that's probably the major things that, that comes to mind anyway for that question. Okay, we have an, another one. I'm not sure I totally understand it, but um, the question is, how is the uh, return loss or the S1, S11 uh, during the different phase T-line measurement? How is... Hmm. Well, uh, for what I do anyway, is I'm measuring microstrip transmission lines, and uh, that's a little different than actually what's going on with the radar. So let me address a few different sides of that. So the microstrip transmission line, my test vehicle, as I'm measuring it, I have a couple of rules of thumb, and from DC up to about 50 gigahertz, I think the return loss, S11, needs to be 15 dB or better to get valid data. Once you get beyond 50 or 60 gigahertz, it's really very difficult to get that kind of return loss. And normally 12 dB for return loss or better at uh, 50 gigahertz and above is my rule of thumb. So that's kind of the numbers I shoot for, and I usually get pretty good responses that way and, and pretty well-behaved well insertion loss curves. Now, that's my test vehicle. For the actual radar, uh, the radar itself, the critical portion of the radar is usually the radiating elements uh, and their patch elements, and they're usually what I'd call a step impedance structure where you have a narrow conductor, a big patch, narrow conductor, big patch, and in that case, um, the S11 um, is pretty important because basically a better S11 means you have more radiated energy or you're more effective in receiving energy uh, for these patch elements. And um, that, again, unfortunately, I hate to give you a number because it depends so much on the designs. The designs really does matter a lot. But essentially, if you get a 10 dB return loss at that high a frequency, you're doing pretty good. I have seen better, though. I have seen it up around 15 dB or so. But at 77 gigahertz, it's really difficult to get a good return loss. And 10 or 15 is normal. And it really does depend a lot on the circuit design of what's acceptable and what's not. Okay. Our next question, does your testing indicate any meaningful correlation between moisture absorption specification in percent and the actual increase in insertion loss and the DK variation? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, I'm looking at the question on the screen, by the way. Sorry. Uh, yes. Actually, the best uh, answer that I would have would be the circuit testing I've been doing at 8585. And I showed that on one of the slides back where we show a difference between uh, circuits that were conditioned at room temperature and circuits conditioned at 85C and 85% RH for three days. And we can see a difference in the uh, design decay and the phase measurement and insertion loss. And I did report that back on, sorry, I don't know what slide that is. That's several slides back. So we are able to do that, and um, we are actually extending that study to get out farther in time. So right now we have a lot of data at three days, and we've been working on doing studies out to 1,000 hours, and I think that's uh, what I've been told anyway. That's really what the industry is interested in, is seeing what kind of effects that we can see at 1,000 hours. But yes, we can see differences in the uh, dielectric constant as perceived by the circuit, the design decay, and also insertion loss and phase measurement and impedance, we can detect all that, actually. Okay. Another question, is there a diminishing influence of the woven glass due to skin effect and the distance of the glass from the surface? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, yes, there is. And uh, really, if you have uh, a circuit material where the glass in the cross-sectional view if you have copper on the signal layer, copper on the ground layer, um, if that in the, the cross-sectional view is mostly glass, then you're going to have a very dramatic, uh, the, the, the glass sleeve effect is going to have a very dramatic effect on the RF performance. 
Now, if the glass is buried deep into the substrate, far away from the copper, and it's not a major player, let's say, next to the, the, the copper itself, then in that case, the glass weave effect is still there, but it's been minimized a lot. And then the other thing is, once you throw filler in there, that helps a lot, too, because the filler helps this decay difference between open areas and bundle areas. That decay difference is now filled in with filler that's actually a different decay than the resin, so you actually get kind of a blending. So if you do have uh, an open weave glass with filler, like our 4835 Low Pro, uh, that does have 1080 glass, open weave glass, and it's also got ceramic filler. We've done studies on that, on the glass weave effect, and um, thankfully it actually looks very well. And I think it's because that filler is in the areas of the open weave, and you don't get that abrupt difference in dielectric constant. So I'm not too sure if I actually answered that completely, but... Uh, it is true that if the glass is close to the signal conductor, that does have more of an influence than far away, and that's why we actually bury the glass down in our substrate deeper when we have glass reinforced laminates. All right. Next question. Do you have any comparison data between the 1067 and the 1078 weaves? Not yet. I'm uh, getting ready to do another glass weave study, actually. And I'm going to be looking at more glass styles and also uh, filled substrates versus non-filled. And I'm going to be looking at a whole bunch of different things. And I will look at different um, spread glass because I think the spread glass still does have a slight glass weave effect because it is spread on one axis, but the other axis isn't. So you still get a little bit of a knuckle bundle relationship, but it's minimized a lot. So I want to look at these different spread glasses and different flat glasses. So that's going to be part of the upcoming study. But unfortunately, right now, I don't have the data. All right. It would be a good topic for a future webinar. Definitely. Another question, how does the bond strength vary between the smooth, the smooth ED, and the standard ED copper? Well, on a lot of laminates, there is pretty big variation. And, you know, you kind of have to expect that, too, because what happens is when you have ED copper that's high profile, you got a lot of tooth. you got a lot of surface area for the bond between the substrate and the copper. And that's normal. And whenever you reduce that with a smoother copper and you have less surface area, you are going to have lower peel strength, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast. Uh, however, different laminates and different formulations will react to that differently. In some cases, you can get very poor peel strength. In other cases, really good. So as an example, in the case of the RL3003, I've looked at peel strength numbers several times, and looking at ED copper, which I showed uh, pictures in, in, the, uh, in this presentation, ED copper versus rolled copper, and there's a big difference in surface roughness. And the difference in peel strength, as I remember the numbers, is roughly 12 versus 8. So 12 for ED copper and 8 for rolled copper. And uh, 8 sounds like a lower number than 12, obviously, and it is, but I'm telling you, 8 for peel strength is extremely good. If you go off and do a lot of peel strength testing on other materials, which we do, uh, having 8 peel strength, 8 pounds of peel strength, that's considered very good. So depending on the formulation of the material, and uh, other things, the rolled copper can decrease um, peel strength, and it will compared to ED copper some, but it also depends a lot on the formulation of the material itself and how the material is made. Okay. We'll try to squeeze in a few more questions before we uh, conclude this webinar. Uh, this one is usually with the Rogers 3003 material. The question is, what is advisable to use as a core and a prepreg from the point of adding mechanical stability and thermal performance. Nice. That's a good one. Um, actually, we see that a lot with the uh, 77 gigahertz automotive radars. So they are hybrids, as I said before. And normally what they use is the 3003 or the 3003G2 on the RF layers, copper layer 1, copper layer 2, copper layer 3, 4, 5, and 6 are usually a high TGFR4 layer. And those high TGFR4s are usually formulated to have uh, – well, as the name implies, a high TG, of course, but also they usually have a, a pretty good CTE, and um, it's usually a pretty good match between those FR4 materials and our 3003. So really what I would look for uh, for material differences between our 3003 and FR4, I'd try to match uh, CTEs, and uh, that'd probably be my biggest concern, to be honest. But there are FR4 out there that's the typically the high TG FR4, which is a little more expensive for FR4, uh, but still not too bad. Uh, but you can find some that match pretty closely at 3003, 
and uh, will give you very reliable uh, results for building a frame circuit board and reliable plated through hole, reliable micro vias, all that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, another question uh, from your perspective, working with automotive suppliers uh, and looking at the automotive application, is there a preferred method of propagation from the strip line circuits? Would you say it one more time, please? Sure. Um, from the automotive uh, applications perspective, is there a preferred method of propagation from the strip line? And I'm assuming they're talking about launching in and out. Right. Yeah, most of what I see uh, on these applications, typically it's either a micro strip on copper layer one and copper layer two or a granite cool planer waveguide. And a strip line is obviously a three copper layer circuit for the RF structure. So it'd be copper layer one ground thing, copper layer two signal, copper layer three ground. And I don't see that too often in these applications, and mainly because it's very difficult to get the uh, the signal wants to, uh, or basically get the signal to transfer down into another layer like that at that higher frequency, even though it can be done. Um, so there's a bunch of tricks to do that. And I've actually been doing experiments, actually, as of yesterday, I've done a lot of testing on some experiments I've been doing where I'm using a micro via, and I'd call it a Z-axis ground coplanar waveguide to make that transition. So going from copper layer one for my where my connector is basically, and trying to get that signal to transfer from copper layer one to copper layer two within a strip line, um, that transition I'm doing with a micro via. That way you don't have a stub. So I have a micro via that goes from copper layer one to copper layer two for the signal. And around that, I have a lot of grounding, so it almost acts like a Z-axis or thickness axis uh, ground cool planar weight guide. And that seems to work best, but it really is a lot of trial and error, and um, it's really good to do a lot of electromagnetic modeling if you can on that via. Uh, but for me, it came down to brute force, just doing a whole bunch of different designs, building a lot of different circuits, and then just testing these, uh, these uh, test vehicles essentially to see how to get that transition optimized. Interesting. So I'll squeeze one more question in uh, since it's uh, kind of a takeoff from what you just talked about. Are there applications that use a coplanar waveguide without a ground that might benefit from the 3003 G2 product? Huh. So if it's a ground coplanar without a ground, that's a one copper layer circuit usually. So I'm not too sure how to answer that because I haven't seen it before. Uh, it's possible. Um, well, I'm not too sure how to answer that because normally the complexity of the radars is such that you have to have these other layers in there. So the the layering with the FR4 is not RF layers. It's usually control layers, power planes, data, things like that that's not sensitive to RF. So you usually need those other copper layers. And uh, for a single granite coplanar waveguide, uh, you would, the design would be significantly different from anything I've ever seen before. It's an interesting concept. I'm not saying you can't do it. Um, I just don't know exactly how to do that right off the top of my head. But in the case of the RL3003 G2, I think that'd be a really good candidate to use because of the copper being so smooth and also the filler being uh, spherical and small, which means uh, you're going to have a more homogeneous type of substrate. And in this case, you have a lot of coupling from the ground signal ground, and having a more homogeneous substrate would be beneficial for consistency. So I don't have a really good answer for you just because I've never seen such a thing. And I think it's possible, but I just I haven't seen it. All right. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for more questions. I would um, refer some of uh, you who have questions we weren't able to answer to some of the resources that John talked about on the Rogers uh, Tech Hub, and uh, Rogers will also have a copy of all the questions, including the unanswered ones, and, and can follow up if appropriate. So I would like to thank Joey Kellner and John Coonrod and Rogers Corporation for today's presentation, very informative about the critical material properties for millimeter wave radar being used in uh, ADAS and autonomous driving applications. A reminder, this webinar has been recorded. It will be available to watch again within about an hour. You can find it at the Events section of the Microwave Journal website. From the home page, just click on the Events tab, then Webinars, and you'll see a link to the archives at the top of the page. So if your colleagues would benefit from watching this informative presentation, please do let them know. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.